Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Leaders in triathlete sweat testing and hydration with multi-length, multi-length, yes, multi-length and multi-strength electrolytes that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off with the code OxygenAddict15 and listeners can also get an exclusive 20% off gift cards via the link in the show notes. And Team Oxygen Addict at team.oxygenaddict.com. Event-specific training plans, coaching guidance from Coach Rob Wilby and supportive teammates in a private Facebook group. Fueledbycake.com. That's my charity cake recipe book featuring Vicky Holland, Emma Pooley, Chrissy Wellington and loads more. And you can get it for £10. No discount on that one, Rob, because it's all for charity. It's all for charity, mate. And finally, a big thanks to our patrons who support the show with a monthly donation. And if you want to get involved in that, you can click on the link on the homepage or follow the link from the show notes. So hello, 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 and welcome to the show on the 27th of or the week of the 27th of November as we record. Hello, Hells. How are you, my friend? Rob, I'm very well, thank you. I saw that you did indeed meet your promise because you sent me a photo this week of a little bit of baking. I I am so proud of myself. <laughs> I am so proud of myself. I made some chocolate brownies. <laughs> Me and my little dude, mixing bowl, little chef aprons on. <laughs> and they were good as well. They there were good. Go. Did, it did you enjoy it? The last shall not. It was, it was really good fun, actually. And I've got to say to any other people out there who are terrified by the thought of baking, it turns out you need a bowl, some stuff to chuck in the bowl, a spoon to mix it up with, and you lob it in the oven and you're done. That's it. I told you. You just you just need Who to be able knew? to read. Who knew? You just need to know how to read and how to turn the oven on, and you can have your own supply of brownies forever. That is exactly it. I'm so honestly. I'm. I feel pretty proud that you did that. Thank you very much. So this is how it begins, Hells. I'm going to get my copy of Fuel by Cake. I'm going to start making one thing every. Me and Xander went down. We bought all the all the little um what they call ingredients from the supermarket got distracted a bit by the lego ninjago magazines had a bit of a paddy we couldn't have the lego ninjago magazines decided we'd rather have the magazine than all the baking stuff we bought the baking stuff anyway big scene then we did the baking and it was all okay oh <laughs> i love that no honestly i feel very uh very proud that you actually did do it so you've done brownies which that's really, really good. And so you've got to make your Nan's date and walnut loaf. I made that over the weekend, by the way. Did you really? What did you think? Yeah. It's very nice. It's very, very tasty. Ah, love it. Good yep. on that. And you need to make Heather Fell's raw energy balls as well, don't you? I do. And I completely forgot to actually buy a copy of the book from you. Well, I, I know. I joined the line and then I wandered <laughs> off. And then I came back and you'd gone. And I was like, oh, darn it. Yeah, I was a bit gutted by that. So, yeah, we had our uh, Tri Club Christmas do, didn't we, Rob? And we had a 10K on Saturday morning to uh, celebrate the life of a of a, of a Tri Club member. And uh, it was hilarious. One of our members turned up in a sumo wrestler suit and ran 10K in one of those blow up sumo suits. But it was quite impressive because he was, he was he's quite quick, isn't he? He was probably the only man who was warm, to be fair to him, <laughs> old Carl. It was, it was a pretty chilly day, wasn't it? It was freezing. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, we weren't the only people racing this weekend. There's been, there's been actually, I was quite surprised at how much racing has gone on. I think the days are long gone when there was any kind of end of season break going on. So we've got loads of stuff to bring you. So results are sponsored by precisionhydration.com. Absolutely. So stay hydrated and balance your electrolytes this winter when you're either in the turbo or you're out doing hot yoga classes. You can get yourself. 20% 20% off the gift cards. Now, here's how it is, fellas, and I am addressing the fellas here. We need to get organized. Christmas is coming. Everybody else in our lives has arranged our Christmas presents already. And let me tell you, you do not want to be getting a gift card for the lady in your life unless she's a triathlete. So you need to be giving hints that this is what you want from your from your great auntie who will normally buy you socks and a scarf. So get on it over at precisionhydration.com. You already get 50% off any of the products there, but you also get 20% off the gift cards via the link in the show notes. Awesome. So, Rob, we're going to start in Bahrain. Mm. Could have been an expensive day, couldn't it, that day for the insurers of the 70.3 Bahrain? Because it was a million dollars on the line if Daniela Reef or Javier Gomez took the win. But 
It looks like the end of a long season for Mr. Gomez in particular. He it, it was all over for him at the end of the swim by the look of things, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was the favourite Norwegian, Christian Blumfeldt, who actually came through Rob um, to take the win in this one, just ahead of defending champion Terenzo Bozzoni. Um So, see Terenzo posted a one fifty eight on the bike on an accurate ninety k. Nice. <laughs> so that's just a shade above forty five kilometres an hour to put it in perspective for yeah, two hours. I, I like that. I like to feel that Christian Blumenfeld these days is is fueled partly on your admiration. I think I think you're <laughs> lifting him along those lightning fast run steps with just uh, he's yeah, he's just he's great, isn't he? And you know I said where well, a few weeks ago I said, well he's putting a few hints out there of like yeah, emojis yeah. of camels and stuff and, and those crazy rides that he had done in in Spain. So yeah, he he's posted his um last four K um, splits, Rob. Now I saw the picture of this on a on a screenshot, but couldn't actually see them. What were they? Go on. Tell oh, me. basically, it went from pretty much uh, three minutes around three three ten three eleven sort of thing um, to about four four minutes. Oh, it just fell apart, did it at the end? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, bless him. I was going to say if it went from three tens and got faster. Lord. No, 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 no. It sort of yeah started at. Um, so uh, first K would have been 312 and then yeah K21 K21 was 403 so yeah 312 kilometer at kilometer 18 of a half marathon (laughs) seriously 312 Uh, so he started off at 312 that's like 235 pace for 800 meters and he went 343 <laughs> was kilometer 18 and okay. then um yeah 21 was 403 oh well he's he's put it in earlier on hasn't he that's <laughs> amazing outrageous. well well deserved win for him then wasn't it for sure yeah absolutely um oh he's he's a great athlete rob yeah Really, really good. Like he put himself in a hole at the finish line as well. Correct, yeah. correct. So, and then yeah. over on the uh, on the ladies' side, it was Danielle Reef had her eyes on the million dollars, but again, I think it just came a little bit too late in the season for her, didn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, Holly Lawrence. Um, there was a really um, good photo of of her taken as she um, sort of went into the lead, basically, and she had like this massive smile um, on her face. And um, she tweeted at the end, I can't believe I managed to pull off a win here in Bahrain. Great way to end my season. Totally unexpected. Honestly thought I was racing for second place when Daniel dropped me like a stone on the bike. And then to have um, Annie Howe nearly run me down in the last couple of Ks was stressful. So, yeah, it finished with Holly Lawrence taking the win in 4 Two thirty-three, ten seconds, Rob, oh. ahead of Annie Haug, um, who crossed in four o two forty-three, and then Daniela Reef in four o six thirteen, and Emma Pallant in fourth in four o seven, and we should also mention uh, Sarah Lewis finishing in seventh in four nineteen, and a great result too for Rachel Hallam tenth in four thirty-two. And there's an article saying Emma Pallant's got her eyes set on Kona for next year. Yes, which will be great. Yeah, yeah great to watch that one. Right? Her run. Exact, a Mundo. And then in the men's race, it was taken out by Christian Blumenfeld in 3.40, Terenzo Bazzoni in 3.41, uh, Sven Riederer for a third in 3.47, just ahead of Javier Gomez in fourth. We also had a bit of fairly lightning fast racing down in Cozumel as well, where there were wins for uh, Sebi Keenley and Lisa Roberts. And I mean, last week we had Lionel Sanders, uh, didn't we go in 750 and change? And everyone mm. was saying, wow, that's amazing after second at Kona. This week we've got Sebi Keenlay doing essentially like kind of even faster than that with a 748 at Cozumel. Yeah, that's just is... the, the days of. <laughs> I mean, it almost used to be like. People used to race that, the inverted commas, the validatory Ironman to validate for next year and and almost be like just trying to stay on the wrong side of taking the mickey 
just do enough to get around and not be accused of deliberately going slowly. But to go 7.48 a month after Kona is mind-blowing. 4.11 on the bike in a 2.51 run. Yeah, that is, that is good going. One thing Rob, I would say is that those swim times are crazily, crazily yeah, quick. Yeah, fairly toasty. 42, like, ridiculously 30. quick. Yeah, that, I mean, so... Yeah, I think I think we call that current assisted, don't we? I, I think so. <laughs> current assisted uh, in four directions. Yes, I, th- I think it, it it may well have been. So, yeah, but still, I mean, great to get that win, isn't it? And clearly, still in awesome form. Yeah, yeah even good. after COVID. So, yeah, so Sebi Kino took the win, Michael Vice second, Ivan Ranya third, and then in the women's race, Lisa Roberts getting there across the line first ahead of Kirsty Jan of Canada and Sonia Tadjic of Germany eh, who just snuck over in 9 9.53 Rob nine sorry hours. 9 hours yeah. and 53 seconds I should say just outside the magic number yes exactly exactly and then Rob down under uh, it was 70.3 um, Western Australia uh, sorry Western Sydney um, and <laughs> yeah, it's confusing down- doesn't it <laughs> No, I'm just being stupid. I think I've just had a, it's a long, long Monday day. where yeah. my brain is fried. Um, so, yeah, I know it's Western Sydney, and I know that Sydney is not in Western Australia. So, um, <laughs> Dan Wilson um, finished his racing career, essentially. Well, he's now going to retire from from triathlon. So, he took out the win in 3.42 with a nice 112 run to finish off, just ahead of wow. Tim Reed and Braden Curry in third. And then Mel Hauschild returning still on that comeback, really, isn't it? From from a, an injury oh. uh, stricken season. Injury, in four and injury. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Ahead of Felicity, Sheedy Ryan, and then Amelia Watkinson in third. Cool stuff. And I think we've, we've got to give a huge shout out here to this. I've followed this event for years and years. It's got a big place in my heart. The Ultraman World Championships took place in Hawaii over three days. Uh, We had wins for the UK's Rob Gray and also for Steffi Steinberg. Um, Do you want to know the distances of this, Hells? Yeah, please tell me, because I know overall it's like 320-odd miles, isn't it? So day one, 10K point-to-point open water swim. Yep. Followed by straight out the water, 90 mile bike ride. Day two is, let's get this right, is it 172 miles on the bike, I think? And then day three is a double marathon that goes yeah. down the coast of Hawaii from Harvey to finish at the airport. So 52 odd miles. Now, obviously, this, this event has been gaining popularity and the standard of athletes has been increasing year on year. How fast do you think it's reasonable to expect somebody to run the double marathon on day three of this event? So I would go for a, uh, I'd say seven hours is pretty. Yeah, I, that's it. I, back in the day, I used to think, right, if someone's gone under eight hours, two four hour marathons, good effort. And then mm. it became if somebody goes under seven hours, two three thirties back to back, good effort. Second place. What's his name? Somebody Howard, Jeremy Howard, six twenty-four for the double marathon. <laughs> that is... He started day three, forty minutes down on wow. on the win, and he clawed back thirty-five minutes and sixteen seconds of it to fall. I think he was Robert, five I... five minutes short of the victory overall at the end. Which you don't imagine, do you? After three hundred and twenty-one miles of racing. A six, to just have six twenty four double marathon. Yeah, that is his legs. What are they made of? I have no idea. And this is the day after a hundred and seventy mile bike ride. And this yeah, is the day, exactly. day after a ninety mile bike ride following a ten <laughs> ten kilometer swim. Um, yeah, it's just bonkers. So, Rob Gray is is actually British. I got an email from uh, from Matt Botterill, who's done some coaching of him this year, and so we're going to try and hook up an interview, hopefully. Um, so he's taken out the win in overall time, 22 hours, 19. Jeremy Howard of the USA, 22.25. And Arnaud Selkoff of France in 23.17. On the women's side, we had Steffi Steinberg in 26.02. Amy Kraft in 30 hours, 37. So a four-hour victory. And Fiona Semlink of Texas in 30 hours and 45. 
Wow. And uh, Rob, things, two things jumped out at me there. So Fiona Simulink, who you just mentioned, is 51 years old. Uh, yeah, the so guy it's... who was fourth was 56. Yeah, it's a, it's keep on so getting better. Deca, the endurance Deca Dave getting territory, there. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Deca Dave territory. Yeah. Get bad you and wow. Dave just ran into this. I think it'd be right up his street. Wow. You never know next year, Rob. Well, following on from that, there is going to be an Ultraman UK happening next year. I don't know whether it happened this year. It's It's been on and off a bit over the years, but in the, based around Lake Bala on the 30th of August to 2nd of September 2018. So, any super ultra endurance lunatics looking for a challenge? Wow. That'll be... You know what? Um, I, I'm not trying to sound tempted here at all. It'll be pretty stunning, though. The run goes from Betsy Coed... Yeah, you run to the Snowden Marathon route and run yeah. around the Snowden Marathon route. You know, it goes up Lambaris Pass, down the far side through Nam Paris, and around there, and then you run back to Betsy Coed. Seriously, if you, <laughs> that would it would be beautiful. Yeah, but, hard, really. But you, but all you're going to see really. of it is going to be the one and a half meters of tarmac in front of you for the whole day, right? No, well, I think I'd be looking at a mountain around me if I'm. <laughs> I would absolutely be taking in the environment. It's hard enough. You may as well try and make it that little bit better for you. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd it's, like it's to say that I took in the, the, the three peaks when I did it, but I mostly saw my own shoelaces oh. for fourteen hours. Well, anyone who fancies it, seriously, um, do make sure you look around at some point because it's a stunning part of the world. Yeah. Too right, says Helen. Uh, Rob, I know we're going to do Coach's Couch shortly, but I just wanted to uh, let people know that in a moment we're going to be hearing part two of David McNamee's interview. So hopefully you heard last week's when um, he was telling us about how Jan Fredino essentially had been his mentor um, in the run-up to Kona this year. So we have part two, which involves some of your questions coming up. But first, let's... Um, should we do Coach's Couch, Rob? We should do Coach's Couch, Yeah. Okay, so sponsored by Team Oxygen Addict. Yes, indeed, Lee Doodley. Uh, the team is now closed until next year. Um, but if you're interested in maybe getting some coaching next year, you can just put in your email address into the waiting list and we'll contact you when we open again. Probably it's going to be February time at the earliest, we think. But so following on really, Hells, from last week's questions about recovery, I, I think we've hit upon a, a bit of a hop topic at the moment. A hop, uh -huh. a hot, a hot topic at the moment. Because I've had a couple more questions through about recovery um, and swimming in general. So the first one is, if I've got a recovery swim scheduled, should I do it or should I have the day off instead? And the, the questions literally come up four times in the last day and a half. And so I thought, well, it's got to be one that's worth answering. So here's my take on this. We can kind of divide people into, into two groups of people. We've got average and above swimmers and beginner swimmers who are still learning to swim. And, and by beginner swimmers, what I mean is everything about swimming feels difficult and challenging, and you're always out of breath. If you're in that kind of group, it's really difficult to do any kind of meaningful recovery swim because you're automatically working just a bit too hard to get any kind of meaningful recovery out of doing the swim. Because what we're looking for is for your body to be more recovered at the end of it. It's meant to feel like a yoga session, basically stretching <laughs> in the water and a free massage by kind of flapping around in the water, rubbing against your muscles and promoting blood flow. So if you're the kind of swimmer who is filled with dread at the thought of the pool and you get in and everything's a battle and you haven't got your breathing and stuff nailed yet, my advice is to not do a recovery swim when scheduled. It's to have a day of rest and recovery in your body in particular, but recover better by just having a rest day. For the for the good and the above average swimmers, if you can choose the pace that you swim at and you can choose to swim slowly, then you're at the point where a recovery swim is going to do you more good than not having a recovery swim. And I'd say unless you're completely wiped out mentally, you will feel better at the end of having a recovery swim than not. And I've talked to a lot of athletes who've gone through kind of sort of our progression hells of not being really swimmers to being yeah. people who can swim a bit. And and you can understand the arc, can't you? There's a very definite point where you went from, oh my God, everything's a battle to, yes, oh, definitely. I can, I can actually kind of float around and I can choose whether and I, I enjoy I this. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're looking forward to a recovery swim, it's a good sign that you can go and do it. And if everything's a battle, don't do it. 
Okay. And that kind of leads on to the next question, which is how fast or more importantly, how slow should I do the recovery swims? And so what I thought, I'll, I'll give out the rule of thumb that I use. And I'm going to qualify this by saying I've got no I've got no scientific basis for this other than just having watched hundreds of swimmers from pool deck over the last decade or whatever. Um, and if we use the swim smooth CSS kind of test, which is what I use with my athletes, critical swim speed kind of being an analogy for functional threshold on the bike or threshold running for the run. Your critical swim speed is tested by doing a 400 meters and then a 200 meters a couple of minutes later. You plug those two numbers into a into an online calculator and it gives you quite accurately your critical swim speed. So that's the first point. Just doing the 400 isn't enough. You don't do a 400 and then split that divided by four and go, that's my CSS pace. That ain't what it is. That's your 400 meter pace. OK, so when we know what your CSS pace is. For most people, CSS seems to be around four or five seconds per 100 slower than your 400 meter pace. So if you're a, I don't know, if you're a six meter, six minute swimmer for 400 meters, that's one minute 30 for every 100. So your CSS pace will probably come out around 134, 135 as a rough rule of thumb. Does that make sense so far? Yep. And then... For every kind of level back down, if we think of you know the five training zones and we say that CSS is zone four, if you just add on four seconds per hundred for each zone down you want to go, if if in our example we had the one thirty four swimmer at CSS, we had four seconds on a zone three swim is going to be one thirty eight, a zone two swim is going to be one forty two, and a zone one recovery swim is going to be about one forty six for this particular athlete. Yeah. So you're swimming and your recovery swim really bloody slow relative to how fast you can go, right? And most people, when they start out, can't choose the pace they swim. So just try and slow re- swim really slowly. For those of you who are listening to this and going, I've never swum that slowly, well, give it a try because the purpose of that recovery swim isn't to get any kind of fitness benefit. It's to give you a recovery benefit. I think those paces are really interesting, Rob. Like I said, I've I've got no science. It isn't like Jack Daniels who did, you know, literally thousands of runs with fellas with, you know, he used to, do you know how he used to do it? Um, he used to drive around the running track in a golf buggy next to the runner and they had like a nose clip on and their mouth breathing out into a plastic bag that he collected all the air in. And really? He, and yeah, I think it was called the Douglas bag. These were still being used back in the day when I was at university, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But then he had... <laughs> kind of plugged this bag into a machine and it sucked all the air out and did the analysis and and worked out what percentage of VO2 max you'd run at. So it's nowhere near as scientific as that. It's just, it seems to be a rough rule of thumb. So that plus or minus four or five seconds type thing. Interesting. Interesting. In conclusion, I'm absolutely rubbish at swimming slowly. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the good news is everybody is. Hardly anybody ever swims slowly enough because they find that swimming slowly is really hard. Yeah. If you take away that kind of, like the kind of hydrodynamic lift you get by swimming quickly, it's quite hard to balance in the water, but it's really good for you. Hmm. Hmm. But then if you do that, you have to make sure that your hard swims are hard. There you go. Yeah. And that's the, that's the interesting thing with swimming, isn't it? I don't think anybody ever needs encouraging because we kind of accept that's how swimming feels. Most hard swims end up feeling hard. It's the... <laughs> Most swims feel hard. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's like the uh, like the volume control on the Marshall amplifier. It, it goes all the way to 11. Well, in swimming, it doesn't. There's just one knob. It just goes to one. You just get in and swim hard. <laughs> so you've got to learn to go slowly to realize that you are actually choosing to swim harder. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Cool stuff. Now then, this leads us beautifully into our interview with David McNamee. It does, Rob. Part Doesn't two, it? because have yeah, we done well? Yeah, yeah. It's like we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, we never plan things. Um, that's a joke. <laughs> so, Mr. David McNamee 
brilliant part one last week. And so in part two, um, we asked for your questions. So David answers quite a few of your questions. Some of them he covered in part one of the interview um, without specifically saying, OK, this question comes in from, you know, John in in Norfolk. But at the towards the end of it, it's also really, really interesting about that balance in life. So have a listen to part two of our interview with David McNamee. I liked your um, your tweet the other day, which was uh, about the seasons and the sort of coffee stops. And at the moment, they tend to be more pub stops. Oh, very much so. Well, yeah, here it's like, it's cafe it's culture bar. with like bar here in Girona. So like, yeah, they have very much these, you can have a coffee or you can have a beer. Right, right now I'm tending towards beer. Beer is much more enjoyable right now. You put in some, there's like a wonderful thing called patatas bravas they have in Spain. And I could live my life off them. So right now it's very much sort of enjoy, enjoying it sort of. I've not cycled with a bike computer since Hawaii. I've not ran with a watch since Hawaii. I've sort of went out and just enjoyed myself. And when I get bored, I sort of come home. Uh, that's sort of the structure of my training right now. And is that going to be the case for the next couple of weeks or after Christmas then when you get back on it or before Christmas? Uh, So we have, I think, 4th of December is when we'll sort of start following the plan again. Uh, But again, it won't be anything crazy too early. I probably won't race now till April. Uh, And I think also in the past years I've always got back too quickly. Uh, Sort of... Yeah, so this year it's going to be December the 4th, go back to like a structured plan and then sort of gradually build up uh, through like the winter and sort of aim for my first event sort of April time. Uh, so yeah, so I've still got another two and a bit weeks of just sort of, I call it, I'm a professional exerciser right now. Like, and it's really a good life, you know, I couldn't do it 12 months of the year. I'm sure I'd get bored and sort of, yeah, but right now it's sort of, sort of nice just to go out and relax and just I love cycling I love running I love swimming but it's nice you sometimes you can sort of when you're always like targeting pace and power and times in the pool you sort of you can lose sight of the fact that you actually just love it uh so yeah for me to sort of go out on a bike and just sort of just enjoy being in people's companies and stuff enjoying being outside in the sort of countryside it's yeah it's nice to reconnect of why you're doing this sport definitely oh yeah I, I think that is so important and and to have that mental break as well isn't it it's just oh, it keeps you going and gives you more to want to go again next season oh yeah very much so and I think sort of yeah especially after the world championships especially corner is such a big thing especially mentally uh, it's very good just to relax and chill out and just not worry about it because there is especially in Ironman there's just such a big mental toll that racing takes on you that you don't really appreciate it uh but yeah it's nice just to have this break and just sort of mentally recharge as well as physically going back to I want to ask one more question about that race right what was it like being in that race with you know Lionel Sanders uh who just we were following it and it a, he's just like a, a, an amazing beast and then obviously you were running with Patrick Langer weren't you and then he went on to win it so what was it like being with those guys and like right at the pointy end of it uh, well when Lionel came by on the bike with Cameron Wuff and Sebastian I didn't like that point at all to be honest I thought this is crazy uh, just the sheer power that those guys came by at it's like I might see these guys sort of at the finish line. Uh, but yeah, like, crazy enough, like, uh, I think with 80 k's to go, the one person that I found myself with was Patrick. And we could see, like, the sort of the second group on the road, so behind sort of Lionel and Sebastian and stuff. By this point, it all broken apart the race, but we could see... Me and Patrick could see the group that we needed to get to. And it was very much okay. We need to get there. We're going to have to work together to get there. So there was me and Patrick. 
with eighty cuties to go in the bag, just like just like turn ourselves inside and out for one another, just to try and get ourselves back with a group, just so we can mend. It's not just like everybody thinks it's a lot easier in a group, but I think the beauty of being in a group in Hawaii is just mentally as well, is that you can switch off instead of like focusing purely on power and stuff you just need to focus on holding that gap to the guy in front uh so yeah for me it was that point was very good to have patrick around because i think if patrick wasn't around that point sort of i would not be in the podium uh i think patrick probably would say the similar thing about me was that it's crazy that the alliance that we made in the road sort of yeah with 80 k's to go on the bike was sort of what got us both in the podium uh it was obviously we both ran fantastically, but we got ourselves in the podium because with 80 k's to go on the bike, we both knew exactly what we had to do for one another to get ourselves back in the game. And you actually say uh, that to each other when you're out on the road and when when in the middle of the race, you're sort of saying, we need to get up there. Yeah, I screamed some things at Patrick and he understood the message. <laughs> <laughs> Even with my Scottish accent, he understood the message and he very much was like, yeah, you're right. We're, we're going to have to go for it. We just need to get ourselves back to this group, no matter what. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then running, sort of, I ran the first 15Ks with Patrick. And then Patrick has this incredible ability that he just does not seem to tire on the run. He just gets into a pace and he just holds that pace to the finish line. And everyone else sort of suffers. And I don't think he's really ever got that message. Uh, so, yeah. I ran 15Ks with him. He sort of disappeared up the road and, yeah, I just got into my rhythm and, yeah, I just sort of worked my way through the field and I knew I'd run well because I knew run training would be going very well in Girona. Uh, but I, obviously you don't know whether it would be enough to get me on the podium. Uh, so I've, I had to rely on other people sort of having an off day in the run. Uh, but yeah, I got there and yeah, with three Ks to go, I passed Sebastian and... What was that bit yeah. like? It's a mixture of excitement and just fear. Because all of a sudden you find yourself on that podium and logically you're, you should be thinking, well, I've been catching him by like a good 20 seconds a kilometre. He's not going to be able to stay with me or get back up to me. But there's a part of your brain that's so frightened that all of a sudden he's going to find something and he's going to chase you back down and beat you. And, like, I'm going by, I'm sort of, like, trying to look behind to see where he is, but then in my head I'm like, don't look behind, that's stupid. Like, that's the first thing you learn about running is never look behind. It just gives the person... So, like, you're half looking, half not looking. You're sort of, like, trying to scream at someone, like, where's Sebastian? And they just look at you like, dude, we can't even see him. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like I'm like no but he, he has to be there uh, so it's not until you actually get on to the carpet then that you sort of you finally like ah I can relax here it's it's done it's, I'm actually going to do this uh, so yeah it's sort of you go through a lot of emotions in Hawaii and I guess next year you would love to improve on your third place yeah I think yeah obviously the goal will be to try and win it. Uh, it's going to be hard, it's, but it should be hard. It should be, yeah, it's World Championships. It's going to be, again, I need to go there as prepared as I was this year and hope that I've moved some things along. And, yeah, I very much have to approach next year as I'm here and I'm going to try and win this. What do you reckon Gomez and potentially Ali Brownlee would do to a world championship race? It's difficult. I think, like with Ironman, like the distance, they'll be very good. But Kona is just special because of the heat and the humidity. And it affects people in very different ways. Like I personally, I find it fine. Like it's not pleasant, but I always perform well in it. But then you get some great superstars in the sport that sort of, they dominate at Ironman through the season. Like I think of like Marina Van Hoonenacker, who sort of at time at a time had the world record for Ironman and he'd go to Hawaii every year and just 
couldn't handle it, just the humidity and the heat. So that's the thing, like, Kona, it's so unpredictable. Uh, like, obviously, what have you is that 70.3 this year is incredible, but there's a much bigger difference between Olympic and 70.3 than there is between 70.3 and Ironman. Uh, so it's hard to predict, and it's it's even more difficult when you're talking about Kona. For sure, especially Javier, just from what he's did in 70.3, is that he will have some phenomenal Ironman races. Uh, but whether one of them will be in Kona, I don't know. Would you love to race against them again, but over that longer distance? Oh, yeah. I think sort of. I love competing against the best in the world, and yeah, come Kona, you want... Yeah, all the best athletes in the world to be there, and yeah, it would be, it'd be great to sort of, sort of race them again. It's nice to see sort of old faces, and you know we already have one Olympic male champion racing, so to have another Olympic male champion racing, to have the Olympic silver medalist racing, it's yeah, I think it can only be good for the sport. David, we were sent quite a few questions from listeners, so we're going to crack through some of them. Um, and we will definitely come on to porridge and jam because we haven't done that yet. And that's a vital part <laughs> of, course, of, of course. this chat. That, 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 that's when we get very personal with things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but let's um, kick off. We can do sort of maybe like slightly kind of quick answer questions, but equally, you know, feel free to go a little bit more into it. Anyway, Shane Wilson says, what do you do to mentally prepare yourself before a big race like Kona? Uh, so Kona's like, you know, it's a world championship, so it's obviously, but especially being a pro, it's even more different because all of a sudden, it's like the one race of the year where all the sponsors are there and everybody who's anybody from these companies are there to watch the athletes. But then there's also like team managers and managers around. So there's a lot more different people around an event than usual. Uh, so that sort of can create mental stress. But I think the best thing that I do is that I bring a friend with me to Hawaii every year. Uh, so I have a good friend, Alex, who comes with me. And the beauty of Alex is that in his day job, he's the sports director for Dementia Data Cycling. Uh, so yeah, when you're used to sort of working and directing it sort of to the fans and Giro and Vuelta, then for him, Hawaii is sort of a walk in the park, hopefully. Uh, so, yeah, I think for me that was... It's just really good to have someone there to look after you who understands who you are as a person and what you need. Uh, so for Hawaii, that's how I mentally prepared, like, differently to other events. Uh, and then just in general, like, I always have, like... I write a plan down of swimming. This is what... I want, this is what I need to do in the water to have a good swim, whether it's sort of get a really good start, like just do 50 fast jokes to begin with and just see where I am after that or, you know, just simple things of like, well, I'm on the bike, this is exactly when I should be eating, what I should be eating uh, and just simple things, but I always have that written down Uh and I sort of go through them like two or three days before the race and again the day before the race, just so I know exactly what what to focus on in order to get the best out of myself. And I think just for me, having a plan sort of really relaxes me. If I have a plan of what I need to do, then I can deal with anything as long as I have some sort of plan. Uh, so for me, that's that's what I do and yeah, especially in Kona, having Alex there is is such a massive help. Sticking with the mental sort of side of things, Carl McPherson uh, says, how do you manage to run down others and knock crack yourself? As in, like, mental training tools during an Ironman marathon. Uh, so in a marathon, so mentally, I never really think about it as being a marathon. So I always wear a watch. And on that watch, I always have just, like, current lap and, like, lap pace average. And I 
no matter where I am in sort of the how I'm progressing, I always lap it every 15 minutes. And so for me in my head, I'm just going out for like 10, 15 minute runs plus a little bit on the end. Uh, and every 15 minutes, sort of, no matter how bad the last 15 minutes has went, I'm always like, well, this is a new 15 minutes. Let's make this the best I can. Uh, so that's how I. So that's what I focus on. It's just, it's just little, little bricks rather than being like this is a marathon. We've got 42 kilometers to run here. It's very much ah, I've got 15 minutes to go. It's, it's fine. It's and then after that, I've got, I've got another 15 minutes. Like Emma can run 15 minutes. Uh, and then like even when I'm going through like a really bad spell, and I think the worst thing we can do to ourselves is that all of a sudden we sort of like. We think everyone else looks very good and they must be going really well. Whereas I sort of have to remind myself, no, no, like I'm not the only one that's feeling awful right now. We're all feeling awful. This should feel hard. Like this is Iron Man and all I can do is my best. All I can do is my best in this situation. And that's how I keep calm and keep moving forward is that just these little tricks. You can trick your mind quite easily. Susie Richards um, asks about Kona. Did you believe that you could podium? I think we've covered that one. But she also says, what do you think is key for a successful training setup? Because obviously you've been based in different places. Girona, you've been in Leeds. Uh, You mentioned Portugal earlier with Joel Filial. So what's key to success? Uh, I think a part of it is maybe depending on what stage of development you are. Development, you are. Yep. Uh, so for me, being like a mature athlete now, for me, I need to be in an environment where I'm just like fundamentally happy to be like a place that I would happily live there, even if I wasn't training. Uh, so I think once you find an environment that you're happy with, then the rest sort of looks after itself. Uh, but obviously for me, sort of something that makes me happy is like the ability to have awesome country roads to go out and cycle on have very good access to running trails, have some nice swimming pools, uh, to have like friends to train with. Uh, but I think the fundamental key, especially for me at this point in my career, is that to be in a place where I'm just happy living. And then once you've got that taken care of, which, you know, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, you can sort of work to improve everything else, uh, so I turned up in Girona without, I didn't know anybody really, I sort of, but I knew like I'd been visiting the city before, I loved the city, I knew I wanted to be here. So yeah, I turned up, I sort of found an access to the swimming pool, I met some friends to cycle with and that started the ball progressing with the training front and then obviously sort of training with Jan and stuff is just sort of, yeah, it's monumentally sort of improve things Uh, see I think it's a difficult question to answer it's very much what stage of your career you're at but for me it's just to be in a place that I enjoy being Kit Walker asks about things that you did differently for being successful in Kona this year but I think we've covered a lot of that and that was um, you know a lot of Jan, basically. We're loving Jan. Um, and um, someone else asked a similar question. Andrew Woodruff has said, what's it like training with Jan? So we've done that one as well. Um, very quick fire ones. Alistair Horribin, have you ever made a bike bottle with Iron Brew? No. No. Oh, good Lord, no. <laughs> I, I, it's strange. Like, I used to love this stuff when I grew up. But now, like, every time I go back, I always try it. And, like, I'm unsure now. Like, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that too loudly they might not yeah I was going to say yeah. I, I might get my Scottishness rescinded exactly right let's move on to porridge then because that will uh, win you a few points back right Nick Nick asks in your expert opinion what is the best way of making porridge okay how long do we have like time wise <laughs> how long do you like, need how, how much detail do we need do we need to talk about oat size first <laughs> for there's different types of oats go on you are clearly okay. an expert I, I personally prefer rolled oats, uh, so those are the slightly thicker ones, 
But again, this depends on geographical location. Because it's very easy to get them in Scotland, but when you move outside of Scotland, finding rolled oats becomes difficult. So that's when you generally get the instant oats, which you know I have my own personal views on them, and maybe I should keep them secret. Uh, let's just say I prefer the rolled oats. Uh, so yeah, so it has to start with rolled oats. It obviously has to be on like a stove top. I hate the microwave. I will never understand the microwave and porridge. It just doesn't. It just doesn't go. Uh, I've used the microwave once this year, and that was three days out after Hawaii, and that was desperate. That was like we were in a national park in a volcano, and the little log place lodge that we stayed in. Didn't have like a stove or anything, but I had a microwave, so that was the only feasible way to make it. Uh, but you felt dirty. Yeah, I, I felt like I cheated. I don't know why. I just, you know, I had to have a shower afterwards. <laughs> uh, so we've got the rolled oats, we've got a stove top, and then we need milk. I know traditional, it's Scottish, it's water, but it's it's not like let's be honest, it's much better with milk. So we have the milk, we have the rolled oats. And then the next ingredient is cinnamon. Ooh. Cinnamon makes life better. It just try it. If you've not tried it, try it. Cinnamon just makes life better. And then we add the fruit. Like for me personally, there's always a banana there. Just it's a staple. And then I sort of I have like a very nice fruit shop near me, and I just go down once or twice a week and just see what looks the best. Uh, so it could be pears, it could be strawberries, it could be peaches, you know. You can freestyle a little bit. As long as it's a banana, you can freestyle. I love this. Uh, yeah. And now the one recent ing- sort of ingredient I've added is that I have a Canadian roommate in Spain. And obviously with Canada comes maple syrup. So recently, recently I've been adding like a little dollop of maple syrup. And it's a game changer. It's so good. It, it's just a game changer, you know. And, and, and I'll be honest, sometimes it's not even a dollop, it's like a river. I don't even want to know how many calories I'm putting into it, but it is. And then afterwards, you've had so much sort of, you've added so much sugar, you probably should brush your teeth. Uh, but it is awesome. Uh, and then the other thing is, like, when you're heating it up in the stove, it's just take your time. Especially with rolled oats, you're probably talking about 12 to 15 minutes of stove time. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't have that much time in the morning, David. Well, this is, you're in England, so you'll get instant, so it'll be like 45 minutes. It's fine. Wow. But you know, this is why I'm always late to like the first sessions of the day. Is that it's doing your porridge. Time. Yeah, it's okay. People understand. It's fine. <laughs> uh, moving on from maple syrup and porridge to jam, uh, Stu Fraser. What is your favourite kind of jam and why? Jam Fredino isn't an acceptable answer because you do say you're a jam snob. I do. So again, we're all talking about geographical location. So the preference in Scotland is that I like Mackey's jam. But, again, when you leave Scotland, it's a difficult thing to find. So here is Bon Mamon jam. Yeah, can't go wrong with that. Yeah, and it has to be like strawberry or raspberry. I don't understand. You know, like you get like apricot and black currant jams. I just don't understand them. Like, it has to be strawberry or raspberry for me. Like, yeah, I don't care how good, high quality the apricot jam is. It's just... It's apricots, it's just no. <laughs> oh, we're moving on, we're moving on to chocolate cake. Uh, your former training partner, one of them, uh, the lovely uh, Groffy, who we had on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, mm. says, how does chocolate cake um, play a role? Because the first part of her question is actually, um, how is a balanced lifestyle important to your success? But the second part is, and how does chocolate cake play a role? Oh, I think chocolate cake makes everything better in life. Especially like if you get like a good sort of like high quality ice cream to go with it. Yeah. Uh, are there any are there any chocolate cake stories? Is there a reason that Groffy was asking about chocolate cake? <laughs> no, I think I think probably I remember she once sort of when she was thinking about moving to seventy point three racing this year, she messaged me to ask me, Oh like what is the difference she's like? And I was like, To be honest, you just need to go and eat some chocolate cake. And uh, that was my that was my coaching advice to her. Oh. Uh, a successful transition to seventy point three is based on chocolate cake. And I think she was fourth at World Championships this year. Correct. That was some good coaching advice. 
was very, I don't I don't even charge for that sort of golden nuggets. <laughs> was it go and eat chocolate cake to just not worry too much about it, or just go and eat chocolate cake to add the extra calories that you're going to be burning or, off for? I, I don't know. I think she was asking for some magical advice and stuff, and that's the only thing that came to my head was, you know, maybe I was eating chocolate cake myself, and I thought, well, you'll be happy eating chocolate cake. It's good fuel for you. And, you know, I seemed to watch she was fourth. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think sort of, obviously, uh, for me, it's, I think we touched the, touched touched a little bit on it when I mentioned about training environment is that, for me, it's very much like having a balanced lifestyle. Uh, and sort of deciding like what I talked about happiness and sort of being in an environment that you like. And I think... I think in the past, sort of, I had this perception of what an athlete should be like and how they should train and what they should be doing away from training or, I suppose, saying what they shouldn't be doing. And that sort of, I forced myself into that sort of lifestyle and that made me miserable. Uh, I probably had two or three years where I was probably living what you'd see as like the perfect athlete lifestyle and, well, what the perceived athlete lifestyle and, yeah, just, yeah. It wasn't any fun. My race results were barely progressing. And, yeah, I took a step back. And I was like, well, what makes me happy? And sort of it was very much learning that balance in, balance in life is that I love training. I love training hard. I love trying to get the best at my body. But I'm also the guy that likes to go and meet some friends and have a couple of beers like three, four times a week. And you know, just talk about what's happening in their lives and stuff because, like, especially in triathlon is that it can almost become, like, all-consuming. Uh, and I think for a few years it was all-consuming for me and I really struggled with that. And, yeah, ever since I sort of took a step back and uh, sort of relaxed a little bit and found some balance in my life I sort of for me that's when the race results really sort of improved was once I found that balance in life once I found that it's actually okay to go out and have a few beers you know with friends and stuff and yeah it's for me it's it's not for every athlete out there but I've accepted who I am as a person what makes me happy and stuff and what ultimately gets the best out of me and that is very much having these different escapes and doing different things and stuff. And, yeah, for me, that's been crucial to my success as an athlete, but also to my happiness as a person. I love it. David, it's been a, uh, I've really, really enjoyed chatting to you. I've kept you far longer than I said I would, for which I am very sorry. But as you're in Spain, you're probably still waiting for about three hours to eat dinner. So, um I was going to say, I, I, I've still got another half an hour to I have to go out and meet some friends for dinner. You know, people are still working at this time. <laughs> That's it, isn't it? <laughs> That's yeah. such a good lifestyle. But I love it. This is what I love is that I love that, yeah, you know, I'll go out, I'll meet some friends and stuff and then have a few beers. I'll probably get home sort of just before midnight. And, yeah, we never train before 8, 8 thoughts in the morning, so I still get seven, eight hours sleep a night. So obviously we're in Spain, so we get the siesta, which is anywhere between like Fits four to five perfectly. minutes to two hours. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> it's a very, uh, for me, it fits. It's a perfect fit that what I have here and that sort of, yeah, that's why I love being here and I love doing the sport. That is brilliant. It is so, it is great to hear, you know, someone who it clearly as you were saying a few years ago came through a difficult patch you've come out the other side you know it's all paying off you're getting the results and as you say you're happy which is brilliant perfect and if you want me to like write up some like recipes for porridge and stuff i'm always more than willing to do that <laughs> like it makes me happy just writing and talking about porridge great deal you're on perfect speak to you later what a good guy he is, isn't he? Really, really good guy. Really, so really great good to see guy. him get that success. I really enjoyed. Hats off to you, mate, for a great interview as well. It was one of the favourite ones. I think you've done that. 
Oh, I really, really enjoyed talking to David. He was, yeah, just very interesting. And it was great to hear his perspective on things in Spain and just that openness of Jan He's really down to speak. earth, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that, you know, he he took that, I guess you could say, a risk or he he was brave to, to take that step and go out to Spain and start again out there in a way and um and it's absolutely paid off and it just it suits him down to the ground i particularly liked the uh was a bit confused by the chocolate cake question from sarah um <laughs> Roffy, who we had on i was very confused by that and i was like but hold on what but i don't understand is there a story behind this chocolate cake yeah <laughs> it's like no, 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 just just my advice. So there we go. Just <laughs> just just eat cake, basically. And then Rob, I mean, yeah, clearly all the uh, triathlon stuff is very, you know, that's uh, fascinating stuff. That's why we listen to this podcast. It's why we do it. But come on, a bit of porridge knowledge. As a man who's passionate about his porridge, no question. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been anybody more more passionate about it ever. Porridge, porridge knowledge. Fact. Yeah. Yeah, he he did uh, tweet something this week about um, finding another ingredient. So he mentioned maple syrup there in the interview, but uh, he, he he's uh, found a bit of Bailey's. <laughs> oh really? Yes. Ah. Yeah. That'll help the help the swim miles pass by more quickly. That's it. Tim put me imagine. porridge with a bit of, with a bit of Bailey's. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't do a lot for my swim form first thing in the morning. Oh God, I don't go there. I think I'd absolutely vomit if I put that in my porridge. I think you're right. um, yeah. Rob, I was going to say, talking about, you know, chocolate cake and cake, a little update and a thank you from everyone or for everyone who has purchased a copy so far. Of yeah, Fueled how's it by, going? Fueled by more cake. OK, so some stats for you. This is a week in, a week since we went live on the website. Yeah. Um, My wonderful parents, I think, honestly, Rob, my mum's been having conversations with podcast listeners over email. She's loving it. <laughs> <laughs> so they are doing an amazing job of posting out the books because I genuinely, I, it would be I think one There's not a one thing on my day, day is no, yeah. I, I, I cannot squeeze that in. So they're being amazing and they are um, posting out the books. So uh, within seven days they had sent out ninety five packages. Wow, brilliant! Yeah, how good's that? So that might not. Be like that's not necessarily one book in each package that could be i mean one super awesome person ordered 20 oh, so they brilliant. sent out 95 packages that's brilliant yeah so oh congratulations so right. mate a lot of hard work has gone right. into that i'm glad to see it being really successful thanks we await the rob will be um order i am i'm going online to, ridiculous though it sounds to have seen you in the flesh not actually managed to have a conversation with you across the crowded bar um but seeing you in the flesh books in hand not more than 24 hours ago i'm now going to order one over the internet great great <laughs> i love this so yeah you can go and get your copy at www.fueledbycake.com uh, there's an online shop and no there is not a discount for oxygen addict uh triathlon podcast listeners because it's for charity people been asking a few people have asked you yeah. are joking if you've asked for a discount on this book Give another donation. <laughs> charity tax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is all for charity. So uh, we're hoping to raise £15,000 for uh, Melanoma UK, Young Epilepsy and East Cheshire Hospice. So thank you so much, everybody who's uh, ordered a copy. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, let's wrap it up, Hells. That's the end of another show. Oh, yeah. I think it is. Oh, Rob, does everyone want an update on the on Helen's injury? Yes, please. Well, a slight bit of a stress fracture going on in the in the femur. Oh man, that's what the results of the scan said. So uh, there you go. Still no running. <laughs> Helen Murray completed Ironman Wales in fourth place in age group with a broken leg. Oh, it's not good. It's not good, is it? No, man. Not you good. You are a hard, hard person. Well, it explains why I was in so much pain. I mean, yeah. that that's one thing now. Um, and it was, I don't know, it started hurting about three, four weeks before I'm on Wales. But at that point, for me personally, it was really difficult to know whether is it in your head or is it actually your body or quite what? I mean, I, I think 
deep down I probably thought there's something not quite right mm. um but still you do question your mind at that point don't you and then there was clearly something very wrong like a day or two after when I was I just I couldn't walk so I was limping and then I continued to limp for a couple of weeks so yeah something not not right so um yeah so there what's we the go, prognosis that... with that then how long before you're like back in back in action back in shape kind of thing what have I you said those things now that... I was like just wait and see things uh, so I, I'm seeing the physio again this week. Um, and originally when I saw him, he said, you'd be looking at three months of not running. So I've oh. pretty much done two months of not running. So it's not that much longer. And then I think rehab and then it'd be good to have a little bit more. I don't know. I don't know. There, there could be more going on, couldn't there? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Best to be on the safe yeah, side, isn't it? With these that's things, that's exactly. And I would, I as I've said to a few people, I would prefer to be able to run in two years' time, you know, and be able to run well again, mm. rather than thinking oh, I need to run next week because actually I don't. Bigger picture, I want to be able to run when I'm like forty, yeah, fifty, sixty. So yes, we need to get the body better. Yeah, you said it, mate. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, there we go. Indeed. We can wrap it up now. Now that everyone's had an update of uh, really. <laughs> I'm sure everybody out there who's got an injury is feeling your pain right now. No question. The brotherhood and sisterhood of injured runners and triathletes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There, there's many, many, many like that. All right. Well, here we go. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. I'm Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And until next week, have a great safe training racing week. Look after yourselves, get some cake made, buy a book if you've not already. And thanks very much to our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. Don't forget to get yourself one of their gift cards for Christmas with 20% off following the link in the show notes. All right, cheers, everyone. See ya. <laughs>